So the first reaction we're going to talk about is a process where water serves as the nucleophile. So the addition of water to a carbonyl is something that's called the hydration of carbonyls. Right? So if we have a, a carbonyl and water adds, we get to this type of species, um, which is called a hydrate, carbonyl hydrate, or sometimes it's referred to as a geminal diol. Uh, the word geminal just means that the functional groups are on the same carbon. Uh, it's derived from the Latin term for twin. So it's a, it's, a, it's a twin diol, basically. Now, uh, basically any aldehyde or carbonyl is subject to this, uh, this equilibrium process. So um, if you put a carbonyl into water, there will be some amount of this hydrate in addition to the carbonyl. Now, the position of this equilibrium is very much dependent on the actual structure of the carbonyl. Uh, so for example, um, most of your standard carbonyls um, that is, such as acetone, for example, um, are going to favor the carbonyl in this equilibrium. So <clears throat> here is acetone with its hydrate. Okay, And this equilibrium um, can be measured and it's about 99.9% .9 of the carbonyl and only about 1% um, of the hydrate. So it very much favors the, the carbonyl form. On the other hand, other carbonyls, such as formaldehyde, uh, will, will be just the opposite. They'll actually uh, be strongly uh, favored to, to exist in the hydrate form. Okay, so there's formaldehyde hydrate, and this is actually um, essentially just the opposite, where we've got 99.9% um, <clears throat> of the material um, in, in the hydrate form when, when this is in water. Okay, so uh, those, those jars of preserved specimens that you saw in your uh, high school science lab, um, that was formaldehyde, but it was aqueous formaldehyde, and so it, it largely existed as this or other polymeric forms. So just in general, if you're wondering what, what favors hydrate or what favors carbonyl, um, and it, it basically has to do with the electronics of the carbonyl. So um, in, in a carbonyl, um, remember that um, you, can, you can sort of think of the, the carbonyl carbon as being um, partially positive because of that dipole moment. And so basically, if these R groups are um, adding electron density to that carbonyl, you're basically, basically going to favor um, the carbonyl form. Right? So that's why we see acetone or, or any other um, standard carbonyl primarily exists in the actual carbonyl form. But on the other hand, if you have a carbonyl in which that uh, th these groups are are pulling electron density away, uh, you know, th you think about uh, this is already delta, uh, po you know, it's partially positive, and if you're now uh, actually removing more electron density inductively, um, that's going to make it feel less and less stable, and so it can actually sort of alleviate that um, by by going to an sp3 situation, so it can actually go to uh, the, 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 the dial, uh, the gem dial, and, and help itself out. It can, it can feel, um, that carbon can feel less uh, bad about itself, okay? Um, and so i give, give you just uh, two examples um, other than formaldehyde of where the hydrate is actually favored. So here's a molecule um, uh, called chloral. So this is a, an aldehyde where you've got a, an alpha trichloro um, uh, substituent. So this is called chloral, and this actually very much um, it exists in the hydrate form. Okay, so here's the chlorides, and then there's our gem diol. All right, so chloral, if you put it into water, will very rapidly hydrate and exist primarily as the hydrate form. Um, and that's because all of these chlorides are highly electronegative. They're pulling electron density away, and so that very much favors this um, form where that carbon can be sp3 hybridized. So incidentally, chloral is actually a pretty potent sedative, um, and this was uh, it, this is used in a in a drink called a Mickey Finn. Um, it's an illegal drink, uh, but um, this was basically used by gangsters um, to to knock someone out. So you put a little bit of chloral in their in their drink, and they drink it, and they basically pass out, and they don't remember what happened. So um, you might uh, hear sometimes uh, this referred to as slipping him a Mickey, um, and that's basically uh, an alcoholic drink with this um, this chloral sedative in it. And the other important um, 
uh, one molecule that I wanted to point out um, is another one that, that very much favors the, um, the hydrate form. So imagine this molecule here uh, with three ketones right next to each other. Now you can imagine that all, you know, these two ketones are pulling electron density away from that ketone in a pretty serious way. And so this too will also um, exist almost exclusively uh, as the corresponding hydrate. Okay, so there's the hydrate. Uh, and this molecule is, well, either one is called ninhydrin. Ninhydrin, see the hydrin is even in the name. Uh, and this molecule uh, actually is used very often to uh, visualize fingerprints. Okay, so this ninhydrin will actually react with um, amino acids uh, that are that are in the cells of, of fingerprints, um, and so that's that's very often uh, used. So a, a hydrate um, with very important uh, uses in forensics. Okay, <clears throat> so let's actually talk about the um, mechanism of this hydration. Um, again, as we uh, we talked about in the generic um, section, um, this can happen either through a, a basic or an acidic uh, type of pathway. Um, the neutral pathway. Neut adding neutral water to a carbon meal wouldn't be very favorable. But we can do this um, in, in either of two ways. So let's, let's first talk about the, the base mechanism. So in this case, what we're gonna do is, so we'll be in water, um, but then we're going to utilize hydroxide, right? So that's our, our base that's actually gonna uh, be doing the nucleophilic attack. So if we have our carbon meal, um, our base then, uh, our nucleophile is going to be the hydroxide. And so this can simply, remember, add protonate. We can just simply add the hydroxide to the carbonyl. And that will give us this intermediate. Okay. So again, we went from anion to anion, so we didn't, didn't have to generate any new charges. And then in the last step, the final step, we're just going to pull off a proton from a molecule of water. And that will then give us our hydrate. Okay. So that's, that's the base catalyzed um, hydration of a carbonyl. And you can see then that we, we generated um, hydroxide from that last deprotonation. And so this uh, means that uh, the hydroxide can be catalytic. So you don't need much. You just need the tiniest speck of hydroxide and that can uh, catalyze the process um, of hydration. Now remember, a catalyst doesn't impact the equilibrium of hydrate versus um, not hydrate, all it does is it speeds up the interconversion. So it speeds up the forward and the backwards. Okay, so it's important for us to keep in mind that this can also go backwards. So what does the reverse mechanism look like? Okay, and I'll just remind you that whenever you do the reverse mechanism, it involves all of the same intermediates, right? So we can just draw all these intermediates and then just push the arrows the other way. So let's very quickly do the, do the reverse. Um, and I'm just gonna redraw the um, the, the hydrate in a, in a slightly different form, um, just so that you can see this. Okay, so the first thing we're going to do, right, so the last thing we did was protonate. So the first thing we're going to do in the reverse mechanism is deprotonate. So we're going to form that. Uh, we're going to deprotonate uh, one of those hydroxyls. Okay, O minus, right, and we just form some water in doing that. And now, right, the, the first thing we did was to add, so then the last thing we're going to do is to kick out. So we're gonna have these electrons dump in and then eject that hydroxide ion. Right? And that will then give us back our carbonyl and generate the hydroxide. Now, <clears throat> you, you may be feeling a little uh, you know, uneasy about the fact that we just had hydroxide serve as a leaving group. And, and you should feel a little weird about that. But keep in mind, in this case, we've already paid the penalty of having an O minus, okay? Uh, and so that, that begins all the way in the start of this reverse mechanism. We had hydroxide to begin with. We basically um, just, just uh, uh, we exchange that for this O minus, right? So that's pretty much thermal neutral. And now this, we're just, exchanging this O minus for that O minus um, and gaining a little bit of entropy in, in the process. So all along we're just we've already had uh, we've already um, taken on the pain of having an O minus and we're just um, exchanging that all the way through. So that's why um, ejecting O minus in this case is okay. Um, 
this is in contrast if you were to substitute O minus with a chloride, that would be terrible. That would not be a favorable process. But here it's just O minus for O minus, and that's, that's then a lot uh, more plausible. Okay, so that was the, the basic uh, mechanism for hydration. We can also do an acid catalyzed um, carbonyl hydration. So acid catalyzed. Um, so now in this case, we're going to have um, basically H3O plus, um, and that's what we're gonna be working with. So it could be HCl in water, or it could be any number of things. Okay, so just like in the generic mechanism, what we're going to do to begin with is we are going to first protonate our carbonyl to activate. Remember, so, so PAD, protonate, uh, add, deprotonate. So if we protonate our carbonyl, we get to our oxocarbenium, right? And now our nucleophile in this case is going to be the neutral water. So that's going to add to that highly electrophilic oxocarbenium. Okay, and now we've got our, our cationic thing here. And so all we need to do to end this off is to deprotonate and that will then lead us to our hydrate. Okay, so that's how that's how the acid catalyzed hydration can occur. All right, uh, and again, we can do this in the in the reverse as well. Um, and again, we're just going to draw all of the same intermediates, push the arrows the other way. So I will do this as I did before. I will draw this in a slightly different uh, fashion, just so that you can see it. Um, and when you do these mechanisms of real molecules, you know the orientation of these things might change. So. Um, it's helpful to, to see all of these substituents oriented in different ways. Okay, so the last thing we did here was to deprotonate. So the first thing we're going to do in the reverse is to protonate. So I'm going to protonate one of those hydroxyl groups. Okay. And then, right, so here we added, so here we're going to eject. So I'm going to use lone pairs on this oxygen and I'm going to have those dump in and then eject the OH2 plus. That gets us back to our oxocarbenium. Okay, and then the final step, since we protonated here, we're going to deprotonate here, uh, and that's going to lead us back to our neutral carbonyl. Okay. And then of course we have just regenerated our H3O plus. Okay, so that's the forward and the reverse uh, hydration mechanisms, okay? And, and uh, both, so just a speck of proton or a speck of OH- minus can uh, rapidly accelerate um, the interconversion of these two species. Okay, so as a um, synthetic tool, hydration actually isn't useful, right? It's just an equilibrium that happens. Um, and, you know, in a case like an anhydrin, that's important. Um, but we're not, we're not actually going to use hydration um, as a synthetic tool because you really can't impact that equilibrium in any useful way. On the other hand, what we're going to see next is that this general um, mechanistic paradigm uh, translates into something that is synthetically useful. And that has to do with the case where we replace water with an alcohol. Um, and so we'll see that in the next video.